Can you see that, Chelsea? Sure can. All right, Chelsea, I'll pass it over to you. Okay, great. So good morning, everyone. Thank you all for joining in this morning. Um, we want to appreciate Sarah for allowing us to do these webinar series and uh, doing all of the uh, logistics for us on them. We are recording, so we'll share the recording with um, the county agents so you can go back and rewatch if you need to, or if somebody's not on, you can watch it. So this first one we have this morning, oh, one more housekeeping thing at the end, please don't just run off. There's going to be a short little quick poll for Sarah purposes. So we'll need you to fill that out. Um, so this morning, Dr. Jeremy Powell is joining us to talk about health and diseases and small ruminants. For those of you who aren't familiar with Dr. Powell, he's a vet and has a PhD. He's a professor at the University of Arkansas in the Animal Science Department. So I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Powell. Thank you, Chelsea. Uh, yeah, Chelsea had asked me to talk with you today about uh, some diseases and small ruminants. And so we'll try to hit the highlights. You know, I teach this as part of a, a diseases of livestock class uh, up here on the Fayetteville campus. And I probably spend three or four weeks talking about diseases of small ruminants. So it's quite a lengthy topic, uh, but we have you know, around 45 minutes or so uh, to visit about that this morning. And I'm gonna try and summarize. And certainly if you have questions as we go through, feel free to stop me and we can visit, you know, if you've seen cases of certain things that you wanna talk more about. But uh, uh, to go ahead and, and get rolling with it, we'll start off with respiratory disease, which is a common issue, you know, in a lot of different livestock species, but certainly we see it in uh, lambs and, and goat kids. And, you know, it, it can go by several different names. Some people call it pneumonia. Some people call it dust fever. Uh, I've heard it called uh, shipping fever, obviously, in cattle. Uh, so there's, there's several different organisms that play a role in respiratory disease. Some of these would be uh, more common in sheep and goats, and then some of them uh, you'll see in small ruminants and then also in uh, BRD and, and in cattle. So Mannheimia and Pastorella are common bacteria that are going to cause problems in sheep and goats. And then we'll also see mycoplasma and chlamydia uh, potentially causing problems in small ruminants. Uh, usually this disease is brought on by stress and that can also you know, be seen um, due to issues secondary to poor nutrition or, or certainly in small ruminants, we can have problems with poor colostrum transfer because they often have twins or triplets and they're not getting enough colostrum. So we'll see this you know, usually in young animals uh, that are uh, going to be anywhere from a few weeks old to up to uh, a year or, or two of age, uh, not usually seen in older breeding animals in a herd. Uh, so some of those other stress factors, you know, if, if we're lambing them out inside or, or kidding inside, sometimes dust can be a problem from bedding. Or certainly you guys deal a lot with um, animals that livestock shows and you see this at county fair and things like that and uh, you know dust can be uh, an irritating factor that uh, can cause some irritation to the respiratory tract and then lead to secondary uh, infection uh, co-mingling and you know that's what we're all doing right now trying to minimize our uh, interactions and so we're social distancing and, and that sort of thing and so when we bring animals together and they are crowded into a space uh, increases the likelihood of things like respiratory disease. Clinical signs to think of, I really like to summarize these using this acronym DART because these clinical signs that you see here that we'll see with respiratory disease, you, if you can remember the acronym DART, those are the uh, signs and I'll, I'll summarize those in just a second that, that we see with respiratory disease pretty much in any livestock species. So if you can remember that, uh, the DART acronym was um, something that came about through a pharmaceutical company several years ago. It's 10 or 12, 15 years old, so you may have heard of it before, but each of these letters stand for something. The D 
stands for depression. And so we're talking about physical depression or, or lethargy, weakness. You know, the animals aren't near as active as they normally should be. The A in DART stands for their appetite. They have a decreased appetite uh, when they have a respiratory illness. The R would be for respiratory signs. So that's things like coughing or nasal discharge, a snotty nose uh, that we would see when animals have respiratory illness. And then T stands for their temperature, a body temperature. And so with small ruminants, you know, they can have uh, their normal body temperature ranging somewhere between 101.5 to 103.5, depending on what the environmental temperature might be on a given day. Uh, but certainly if they have above 104 degrees, we would consider that a fever and then that would be something we would move forward with, with treating. <clears throat> Usually uh, for treatment, that's something that we would probably want to discuss with a veterinarian because there are uh, products that uh, work fairly well uh, with treatment, but most of all of those are going to be prescription products. And sometimes with these minor species, um, you know, the prescription products may be labeled for cattle or they might be labeled labeled for pigs but there's oftentimes very few of them that are labeled for uh, small ruminants with them being a little more uh, minor as far as the the species makeup so i always recommend uh, visiting with a veterinarian about uh, selecting a, a therapy to use for treating respiratory disease uh, we could certainly do culture and antibiotic sensitivity if we've lost a lamb or we've lost a goat kid. We could take samples from the lung tissue and try to determine exactly what the cause was and what antibiotic might work best to treat it. And then, you know, there's vaccine that uh, we can choose to use that are labeled for sheep and goats to try and minimize uh, issues. The one that is most common is uh, this one by Colorado Serum, and it it's both for manheimia and pastorella. Uh, some antibiotics that we can use. So Naxel is labeled for, for goats and it's really, I think the only antibiotic that I know of that's approved for use in goats, but it works well for respiratory disease. Mycotil is, is approved for use in sheep. Both of those would work fine uh, for respiratory disease. The issue with Naxel, you do have to give it every day. And so we can use that same drug, uh, which is Ceftia if you're and a couple other formulations like XNL or Exceed, you may be familiar with those, but they last longer, so you have to dose less frequently. Uh, others that might work well would be Nuflor or Draxin. Uh, any of those uh, tend to work well for respiratory disease. Questions about respiratory disease? Next up here, we have uh, clostridial disease issues. Just before we go through these, clostridial diseases are problems that are usually associated with certain criteria. Okay, so there's something usually that has happened. Oftentimes it would be some sort of injury or insult to the animal's body, and then they have secondary problems with uh, a clostridial bug, and that can be with pretty much any livestock species. We're going to talk just about three of them here in sheep and goats that are the most common ones. The first one here is Clostridium perfringens type C. Okay, and we refer to this oftentimes, you've probably heard producers call it purple gut. Uh, sometimes I've heard cattle producers call this the intestinal black leg. So if you've heard it called that, uh, another name for it's enterotoxemia. Uh, all of those mean perfringens type C. And we see this one most oftentimes in animals that are less than a month of age. So this is in young animals. Uh, usually they're still nursing. And oftentimes we um, have seen a change in diet. So we've either changed their intake on creep feed or, or maybe we've changed their uh, intake on milk. Like if we've separated mom and babies because we're going through and we're uh, maybe tagging all the babies and vaccinating them and we've left them separated for a long period of time, what, what can happen is these little guys can over intake on either milk or creep feed uh, and it changes the uh, environment inside the intestine. So we, we uh, would create a pH shift there. And because of that, we'll get an overgrowth of these perfringens bacteria. And, and perfringens are, are really good at making toxins 
and the toxin that they make uh, in this case can cause hemorrhage into the intestine. So these guys can start to bleed into their intestine. And you can see in the picture down here, this is a lamb that died of perfringens type CBIT. You can see why we call it purple gut because of the uh, intestines being full of basically blood clot when you open them up after, after they've died on postmortem exam. And uh, that can create quite a sudden death loss. So, you know, the animal can look fine yesterday and then you, you know, had this over intake of either milk or feed or whatever, and then they're dead today. Uh, so you get very acute death. Oftentimes you won't see any uh, clinical symptoms before death is noted. If you do see some clinical symptoms, you might notice abdominal pain. And usually, especially goats, it seems like they're, they're very vocal about their pain. And so you might notice them um, vocalizing uh, and, and bleating more uh, because of that. And then you might notice some diarrhea with, with some blood in it uh, before they die. But oftentimes sudden death is the first thing we'll see. There's also a perfringens type D. This is on a little bit older animals, but it'll do uh, very much the same thing that uh, type C is. And usually we'll see this, you know, in animals that are already weaned, they're on a, uh, a ration at that point, they're on a grain diet. And then we get a shift in intake on that uh, diet. Maybe they, you know, were in a pen and, and we forgot to feed this morning. And so we feed tonight and then they over intake on, on the amount that they uh, would have gotten or, you know, wh whatever causes a change in that feed. And then that causes a change in the envir environment inside the intestine. And then you get overgrowth of this. This one produces a little bit different toxin uh, and it can create some problems with the kidneys and lead to de deterioration of kidneys and necrosis of the kidneys. But we'll also see some hemorrhage into the gut as well. Uh, but it too will uh, cause fairly sudden death. Uh, we might notice some clinical symptoms of weakness. You see this guy down here in the middle sort of leaning up against that pipe that's coming out of the ground or fence post, whatever that is. Um, they're weak and uh, they may have some convulsions and seizures before they die. Uh, so if you find one dead, they may have, uh, you know, kicked at the ground there before they ended up dying. But um, not an uncommon one uh, to see in, in sheep and goats. And then uh, the last one here as far as clostridium issues in sheep and goats is tetanus. And, you know, they're, they're quite sensitive and, and can have problems with tetanus you know, lots of different animals can have tetanus, including us, right? So horses can get it, sheep and goats, and cattle can have it on occasion, uh, people can have it, uh, but usually the predisposing factor here and that criteria that I was mentioning earlier, you know, is we have some sort of tissue injury and that could be created on accident or that could be created by us, right? So we could have done some sort of management practice like tail docking or, uh, even castration, band castration or surgical castration. So some, some issue where we've created some compromise in blood flow really to, to tissue. Uh, and these bacteria are anaerobic bacteria. So if we get compromised blood flow, they're gonna grow where oxygen is low in, in tissue. And, and then they'll to produce a, a very potent toxin. This toxin causes problems with, um, you know, neuromuscular activity. And so what happens is they get very contracted muscles and you can see in the pictures here how stiff their limbs look. They'll, they'll have what we call like a sawhorse stance. So, um, you know, that they look like a, a sawhorse and are very stiff and rigid in their stance. Uh, they lose the ability to move their uh, facial muscles very well. So we refer to this disease a lot of times as lockjaw because they can't eat or or drink like they normally would be able to. And then once, you know, the muscles of their diaphragm are affected or their heart, uh, you know, it's, it's game over at that point uh, for them. So tetanus is usually something that we can begin to see clinical signs that doesn't kill as suddenly as the perfringens, but uh, oftentimes we're gonna see it uh, a week or two after they've had some sort of injury uh, occur. So because these things often kill quickly, the best thing we can do, you know, they're hard to treat, right? Because they, they, they can cause sudden death. And, and even with tetanus, there's not um, 
a long period of time that, that you have to treat. Uh, but the best method of control is to vaccinate. And we would want to vaccinate uh, either pregnant does or ewes before they lamb or before they kid <clears throat> so that we're passing that uh, passive immunity on in the colostrum and that can protect the uh, lambs or kids for the first several weeks of their life and then immunize the lambs and kids. Uh, I usually say prior to weaning and then go ahead and uh, booster them again at weaning and that'll uh, help protect. There's a couple vaccines that I usually recommend and you know, there's some that contain tetanus that you can buy that are clostridial uh, vaccines that may contain more than just perfringens and tetanus. And uh, the one that I have here on the picture is Covaxin 8. That's what we use on our sheep flock here at uh, campus, works well. It contains tetanus and both types of perfringens plus uh, several other uh, clostridial bugs. But they do sell a few that we call CDNT, and you may have heard of that, that just contain type C and type D, and then the T stands for tetanus. And those work well too. This is, I think, Barvac CDNT, but there's other companies that uh, make that as well. Uh, just something you need to think about trying to prevent because uh, it's, it's a tough one to treat. Uh, so some reproductive issues uh, up next. Um, got a few things here that are infectious and one thing that uh, is not infectious, it's this pregnancy toxemia that we'll oftentimes see. Uh, this is one that we deal with, you know, when we're in late, gest late gestation. So they're um, uh, getting ready to lamb or getting ready to kid. <clears throat> and maybe we've got, you know, it seems like you especially see it in, in thin ewes or thin does like we have in the picture there that may have not, um, had enough groceries uh, during the gestation period. And so they're a bit limited on uh, energy uh, going into lambing or kidding. And, and what happens, you know, is we get very rapid growth of those fetuses. And usually there's twins and triplets, as I mentioned before, oftentimes in uh, small ruminants. And so you have multiple fetuses that begin to become um, uh, a bigger and bigger maintenance requirement for that female to keep up with. And, and then also she, because they are growing inside their, uh, her abdomen, she has uh, less room for rumen capacity, right? So her intake might drop because she just can't eat as much uh, due to minimized rumen fill. And then we can have other issues on top of that. Like, you know, here in Fayetteville, uh, we were lambing uh, this month, as many of you may have been, and, and we had all that terrible weather two weeks ago and uh, trying to keep ewes, uh, you know, in, in a warmer area. And so weather can be quite a concern and be another reason for uh, energy demands and create problems uh, and increase the risk for pregnancy toxemia. And then anything that might cause stress on the animal, things like transport or uh, other management factors that might increase stress. But what we'll see with this is we get into that late part of gestation. Usually they're just weeks away from uh, lambing or kidding and they start to drop off as far as their appetite goes. And then they may act weak. So they're inactive. Maybe they pull themselves away from the rest of the flock or, or herd and uh, are sort of by themselves. And then we may notice them being a bit neurologic. So they're their glucose levels will drop and blood sugar is not uh, at a level where their brain is functioning normally. And they just look clumsy, okay? So they act like they're not able to, to walk uh, quite like they should and, and they're not coordinated in their movement. And uh, we'll notice that. And then finally, they'll be recumbent. So they're down, they can't get up. And, and then certainly if we don't treat, they can, they can die on us. Things to do here, we want to try to get energy into them. So uh, we treat with propylene glycol, which is like a, a syrupy sort of solution that you can buy. Most feed stores carry uh, propylene glycol that you can use, but we give two ounces three times a day. That's what uh, TID stands for there. That's three times a day. Um, if it's a, I also have here induced partrition. So if it's an expensive doe or, or you that the owner is very concerned about trying to save, we, we could try to abort the pregnancy. And we would do that using lutelice and dexamethasone. Um, obviously, if, if we abort the pregnancy too early, then 
you know, the, the lambs or kids won't have uh, a, a very good likelihood of making it, uh, but that may save the female's life. So there's sort of a give and take there. Uh, other things that we can do to try and prevent it is just supplement with adequate energy. And, and by that, I'm talking about a, a ration that probably contains some corn. Uh, you know, it seems like with livestock producers, when you tell them that you, you need to supplement, especially with cattlemen, because uh, you run into this all the time in the winter months, they always want to give more protein. You know, uh, well, protein's not always equated to energy, you know, and if we can give things like more corn in the diet, that'll help uh, supplement uh, energy requirements. And we would do that for the last month, month and a half of uh, gestation to try and minimize the likelihood of this. Some other reproductive issues that we run into <clears throat> that are more infectious in nature, uh, in zootic abortion is called by, uh, caused by Chlamydophila. So this is a, a bacteria, um, something that uh, is transmitted either orally or through the aborted tissues that, that might occur during a um, uh, pregnancy loss. Uh, usually happens the later stages, stages of gestation and uh, we'll see it more often affecting younger animals. So the, the, the ones that are carrying their uh, uh, first pregnancy are, are usually the ones that we see problems in and uh, can often be at a very high percentage of the flock that, that's affected. Another one that uh, can create problems that's infectious is toxoplasma. This one is spread by cats. Uh, so, you know, this is the one they tell pregnant females to be careful if you have an indoor outdoor kitty that could have eaten mice or a bird or something like that. Uh, they come back inside and they defecate in the litter box and then <clears throat> you're a pregnant female and you change that litter box. And if you accidentally uh, are you know, not careful about uh, following up, washing your hands and things like this. Uh, if you ingest any of the toxoplasma spores that that cat had defecated, um, you know, it can cause, cause birth defects in people as well, but it certainly can cause abortion in, in sheep and goats. And most commonly we see it with a, you know, a barn cat that uh, caught a mouse and the mouse had it, the barn, barn cat gets it, the cat doesn't have issues like abortion, the cat gets it as an intestinal infection. And so every time they defecate, uh, that feces would contain uh, the uh, infective cysts that, that cause the problems. And you know, if you had like an open grain bin or, or something like that, where you were storing grain in a, uh, some sort of tub or, or trough uh, and you were scooping it out, you know, cats will jump in there and use that as a litter box. Uh, or they'll defecate on the hay pile or, or whatever. And then you're, you're feeding that to the animals and they become exposed to the infective cysts and uh, can't abort due, due to it. One thing that you can look for to try and help determine if the abortion was due to toxoplasma is that you can see on the uh, placenta right here, you'll start to get those sort of chalky whitish, uh, sometimes they'll be a little bit more gray in color you'll get that pattern on these cotyledons uh, on the placenta. So you can look for that to help determine if it was uh, caused by toxoplasmosis. Not really any treatment here though for, for toxoplasma. Uh, it's a protozoa, so you just have to try and control it uh, through minimizing exposure from cats. Uh, Campylobacter is the last one here for uh, reproductive issues. Usually causes later term abortions. Um, one thing you see here though, is not only do you get a, a female that has aborted uh, due to this infection, but they get pretty sick. And the reason why is they uh, usually have lost the pregnancy and then they'll uh, begin to have uh, autolysis of the fetuses inside their uterus. So they begin to uh, necrotize and you can see the aborted fetuses look pretty grimy here. Uh, so, so they begin to break down and, and uh, necrotize and, and that's what is shed. But, you know, the, the ewe or, or the doe would get secondary metritis, which is just a, a uterine infection. But that creates a pretty high fever and, and they'll be off of feed and they'll be sick and they'll have discharge from their vulva that you'll be able to see. And so it, it can be a mess, uh, especially trying to get her 
uh, over the disease and then get her rebred, you know, uh, the, the follow-up uh, breeding season. <clears throat> there are killed vaccines available for both Campylobacter and Chlamydophila that I mentioned earlier. And we'll talk about what vaccines to use on a yearly basis, but those would be two good ones to think about uh, if they've had problems with uh, reproductive issues in a herd. <clears throat> Tetracyclines are effective at treating this, so the female would need to be treated with tetracyclines. They're also effective at treating Chlamydophila, and uh, that may be something to consider uh, visiting with a veterinarian about. You know, if there's been issue, <coughs> excuse me, if there's been issues where uh, an abortion storm is occurring, it may be wise to go in and treat other animals that haven't aborted yet, but that have been exposed. Uh, so, so something, something be. If it's toxoplasma, obviously it won't help, but if it's Chlamydophila or Campylobacter, it will. And then we have a category here of just other. So we'll talk about some common things that we might see that uh, affect other parts of, uh, of the animal. Foot rots, uh, a fairly common one. You know, you see lameness issues uh, in these animals when we deal with it in, in our animals here uh, at Fayetteville. Looks like there's something on the chat. Yeah, it says it's biomice and labeled for sheep. Gosh, uh, I don't know off the top of my head if it is. Um, I would, I, I sort of think that it probably isn't. Uh, you know, it, it, I, I definitely don't think it's labeled for goats, uh, but it's something that, um, again, to visit with a veterinarian about. And the veterinarian can recommend it and use it extra labely, uh, which we do a lot on uh, products that aren't labeled for certain animals. Otherwise, we wouldn't have antibiotics to treat, you know, elephants or snakes or anything uh, you know, because there's not any drugs label for that. So we, we can operate under that uh, AMDUCA, which is an act that allows veterinarians to do extra label use. But um, I don't know, I, I, I don't think that it is, but I'm not 100% not positive on that biomycin. Uh, back to the foot rot issues, a couple of different bacteria that can cause this problem, Fusobacterium and then one called you know, we learned it in vet school as bacterioides. It's changed its name here within the last few years to Dichylobacter. Uh, so it was bacteria, bacterioides nodosis, and you may have heard it called that, but now it's uh, Dichylobacter nodosis. And this is Fusobacterium necrophorum. So we see it in sheep and goats, and we see it in cattle and other animals. But they can cause foot issues, right? So uh, this is foot rot. Usually you see it uh, creating lameness just in one foot and it'll usually be swollen and sore and they don't want to put it down and, or they're limping on it. Uh, antibiotics tend to work fairly well. Again, tetracycline antibiotics work well. Penicillins work fairly well, uh, especially for fusobacterium. So you don't have to have something that's necessarily a high powered antibiotic. Um, both of those are something you can get over the counter. And then also foot baths. So uh, here's a little setup that I had seen in uh, just robbed off the internet, but uh, it shows some. Um, so we, we would use these in our large animal clinic that I worked in, but they're, uh, they're like a spongy uh, mat that you can coat with a disinfectant and, and uh, a disinfectant solution so that every time you step on it, it sort of uh, sponges out a little solution onto uh, your feet. I mean, we would walk across it with our boots, obviously, but what you're doing here is you've got a water source and you're making them step up onto the spongy mat that uh, contains some sort of disinfectant. And you can use a lot of different things. Bleach is okay to use. Um, any kind of iodine solution would be fine to use. Uh, copper tox type solution, but be real careful with that if, if they're sheep uh, because of uh, copper toxicity issues. But you know, any of those disinfectants would be fine. Uh, caseous lymphadenitis, another real common one that we see a lot, and you know, not much you can do about it, but uh, it's caused by bacteria called Carinibacterium pseudotuberculosis. Uh, it is definitely contagious and something that they usually pick up from the environment. It's a bacteria that's really hardy, so it stays in the environment for a long period of time. And so once it's on a farm, uh, you know, it's real unlikely that they're going to get rid of the bacteria completely because it'll be in the soil for an indefinite period. Uh, the good thing, it doesn't create a lot of death loss, so mortality is low, but uh, it certainly can create some morbidity and uh, 
so that's just generalized illness. And with that, you might have production losses, right? So if they're dealing with an infection, maybe they're not given as much milk and that affects weaning weights and so forth, or, or even being able to get pregnant and so forth. So there, there may be production uh, losses. Lymph nodes are usually in the head and neck region. And, you know, they're um, gonna be at the, like the retropharyngeal lymph node, which is what we see right here. You might see them up under the jaw. So you can see that one right there under the ear, that's a retropharyngeal, or uh, these are called the submandibular lymph nodes under the jaw. If we went right down here in front of the shoulder, there's one there called the prescapular. I've even seen it on back legs, like there's one behind the knee, uh, the stifle joint called the, the popliteal lymph node. But you can find it pretty much in any lymph node, but oftentimes you'll find it around the head and, and neck area most commonly. Uh, these oftentimes will rupture on their own, right, and begin to drain. And you guys may have seen this before, but it's a really thick, uh, purulent discharge that comes from uh, these. So it, it'll be like a toothpaste consistency, and it's usually yellow in color, uh, maybe a little bit greenish yellow in color. Uh, but they'll rupture, and then they begin to drain, and then you know, then they're on the feed bunk, and they're on the pasture and they're on you know the water tank and, and everywhere once they begin to drain and so you have a lot of other animals that could potentially be exposed once drainage has happened. Uh, the other thing that can uh, create more severe issues if we have lymph nodes that are affected internally. So there's lymph nodes in the thoracic cavity and there's mesenteric lymph nodes in the abdominal cavity. If they get um, these abscesses and nose lymph nodes, you, you can't see that outwardly, but you know, what you'll get is just an animal that's a really poor doer. So they're losing weight, you feed them more, but they're not gaining anything. They usually don't really don't have a fever, uh, but they're just lethargic, they're weak. Uh, and then, you know, if they end up dying from it, and you do a postmortem exam, oftentimes you'll find a lymph node in there that was, was abscessed and, uh, and you didn't know it before they ended up dying with it. Treatment, probably culling is the best way to control control it and, and try to cull an animal before the thing ruptures and before it creates problems on a farm. But, you know, once it is a problem on a farm, it's really hard to get rid of. Uh, we can surgically drain and flush them. If we choose to do that, be very careful about where that drainage is uh, going. We want to try and collect as much of that as we can and dispose of it uh, without getting it, you know, in, in the barn lot or in the on the pasture or wherever we're, we're treating this animal because uh, it will continue to drain even after we've drained and flushed it uh, and we may want to isolate the animal to, to minimize the uh, contamination area you know that is going to occur <clears throat> there are vaccines available so we can buy vaccines uh, there's some that they do have for goats and some for sheep um, I've had people tell me and I'm not uh, you know, familiar firsthand with this, but I've had people say that uh, using the sheep vaccine on goats can create abscesses at the vaccination website. So I would be careful with that. They, they make some for each species and I, I would try to stick with uh, the label uh, on those. All right, next is white muscle disease. This is something that we deal with in pockets of Arkansas because we, uh, have issues with low selenium in our soils uh, across the state. Uh, white muscle though is due to uh, low selenium and vitamin E and we see it just in young animals. So here again, like we talked about with respiratory disease and with the uh, perfringens that we talked about earlier, the clostridial perfringens, it's, it's gonna be in young animals. So these guys are young growing animals. They probably didn't get quite enough selenium from mom while she was gestating them during uh, pregnancy and then they're not getting enough as they're growing through mom's milk or uh, you know, even if it's post weaning, once they're weaned and grazing pasture, these pastures are deficient in selenium and then their muscles aren't uh, developing correctly. So here's normal muscle and here's what it looks like if the animal's been selenium deficient. Uh, obviously an important muscle that can affect is heart. So this is a heart uh, that has a lot of issue with selenium deficiency. So you can see how pale it looks and you, 
have uh, poor muscle development. And so when it begins to affect heart and diaphragm, it's, it's game over in a hurry, right, for them. Uh, and there's not a lot that we can do at that point. But uh, to try to minimize issues, we, we want to supplement with selenium. So that's one thing that we can supplement mom with during pregnancy and some, some, something that we can give babies if we are in an area that uh, is low. Here's a couple maps that I got off of. Um, this one came from the USGS, so the, uh, the United States, I think it's called the Geological Survey, uh, but it's a, it's a government uh, website that you can go to. And this, this shows selenium levels in soil across our state. And, and the lighter the county is, uh, the less uh, uh, selenium contained in those soils. So therefore the less selenium there would be in the uh, uh, forages there. And the darker the county is here, uh, the more. And that, that's according to that website that, that I found. This was another one that just sort of had a, a circle here around the Ozark region that said, uh, you know, both adequate and inadequate levels in, in this locality. But you can see there's some other counties here that would be south of there that, that do have uh, low levels of selenium. So what can we do? We could inject mom during late uh, gestation to make sure that those fetuses as they're growing rapidly during the last part of the pregnancy are going to have enough selenium. Uh, we use a product, there's, there's a couple on the market. Uh, I think there's one called Valenium, and then there's this BOCI, that's what we typically use here with our own sheep flock at Fayetteville, but any of those uh, would work fine. Uh, this particular brand, it's, it's one cc per 40 pounds of body weight. And uh, we also treat uh, the kids and the lambs at birth. And then we'll usually give them another dose uh, around weaning. Uh, just wanna make sure we're giving adequate selenium and supplementing that because uh, it, it can be problematic in some parts. Like if we don't use it here in Fayetteville, we'll have problems in our sheep flock. So, you know, even though we may not have been one of the, the lightest colored counties, uh, we, we have issue uh, with it. Um, so blue tongue, another one that's quite common in Arkansas and can affect sheep uh, and, and goats. Uh, we, cattle can be infected with it, deer can be infected. You know, we, we don't really see that big an issue <clears throat> in those animals as far as it causing uh, death loss, but it can in small ruminants. We, we can see it causing problems with death loss and you know, we can also see it just causing illness and them getting over it. But uh, it's transmitted, uh, it's, so it's a virus. It's transmitted by this culicoides uh, fly, or known as a biting midge. Uh, it can create problems with their tongue swelling. All right, so we'll see that, and their tongue sort of turning the blue color as the name denotes. We'll also see some swelling around their muzzle, all right, and around their eyes and face, uh, but you'll get head swelling. And, and then that tongue will be swollen. And that oftentimes you'll get hypersalivation. So we'll see that. And they'll, they'll be standing out there. They'll obviously look sick to you. They'll usually have a fever. They look real weak. They're hypersalivating. They're stubborn and they don't want to move because they're sick. And they're not eating because their tongue's swollen. So you'll see all of those things going on uh, with this. And then the other thing that you see is when you, you get to examine them a, a little more is uh, they'll have swelling around their coronary band, you know, where the hoof wall meets the hairline on their feet, they'll be swelling there and it'll look reddened to you. And, uh, and that's a lot of reason why they're standing by themselves and they don't wanna move is because their feet hurt. And, and then sometimes they'll be dancing on those feet because I mean, it hurts on this side and, and then they relieve that side and then they stand on this side. And so they'll, they'll move. Um, because all of their limbs are, and sometimes they're just laying down, they don't want to stand. So uh, you see all of that uh, with, with blue tongue. And then, you know, obviously if the tongue's swollen and, and they're not eating and they're, certainly if they're not drinking, uh, it can be a problem in a hurry with dehydration and so forth. Yeah, so I already mentioned they have hypersalivation or excessive drooling, hyperemia around the coronary band. So that's right here. You see that, how it looks reddened and, and it'll be swollen. Uh, and, and it creates problems with their feet uh, hurting, like founder in a horse. Uh, you know, you see them sort of obviously looking sore. 
uh, may also create abortion in a pregnant you or pregnant doe. Really, there's not a lot that we can do as far as um, you know, targeting the virus. We, we don't have an antiviral, but we can just try to support uh, symptoms. So give supportive care, make sure they're staying hydrated. That's probably the most important thing. Sometimes we have to tube them to keep, keep water and electrolytes in them. Uh, there's also a vaccine available for it. And then the, the other thing that we wanna try and do is just control the vectors. If we can put fly medication or, or ear tags in them or, or something to minimize the, uh, uh, animals becoming infected in the first place. Uh, hopefully we'll minimize the risk then. All right, another common one that y'all see, I'm sure a lot with 4-H lambs and things would be club lamb fungus. So this is ringworm. I, I, don't, I don't think I put that on the slide, but you know, people also call it wool rot or wool fungus, but it's ringworm. Uh, caused by trichophyte and varicosum. It's the same ringworm that causes issue in cattle or uh, horses, or it can affect you too. So when you're dealing with these uh, animals, maybe at the county fair or, or at a 4 hers home or, or whatever, <clears throat> wear gloves because you don't want to get ringworm and it certainly can uh, cause it in people. Most of you have probably seen this before, but usually you see it in, uh, you know, show lambs. That's where I've seen it most commonly. Goats can get it too, but you see it a lot in show lambs. We keep them slick sheared and um, so they don't have near as much wool on them to help protect them against these fungal infections. And, you know, another thing that we often do is we, we keep them in a pen, you know, and so they're in a shaded area uh, when maybe the rest of their herd mates or pasture mates uh, would be out grazing, you know, uh, and, and if it's a show animal, we're keeping it in a pen and keeping a fan on it. And because it's shaded, uh, the sunlight, uh, you know, is minimized and sunlight helps protect against fungal issues and, and they're just not getting enough if they're in a shaded area, but uh, that's another thing to, to consider. So you'll, you'll usually see it around the head or neck area in these show lambs, and, you know, it's just a circular raised patch. They're pretty scaly. They kind of look whitish gray. I'm sure a lot of you have seen this before, but, you know, there may be wool loss there or if it's in a goat, uh, you know, hair loss, but Around the head and neck is most common. Here's one where it's a little more generalized across this lamb's top. Uh, so it can be that way. <clears throat> it takes a while to recover. Uh, so maybe two to four months, um, depending on what we do and what we use. And, and I have some things listed here that we can think about. So just disinfectants work well. Uh, they help kill a lot of different microbes. So, you know, iodine or chlorhexidine being placed on the uh, topically being placed on the uh, uh, fungal uh, site would, would help kill that fungus. You just get old sunshine, uh, helps UV radiation, will help kill fungus. Uh, there's some other things that you can get over the counter that are fungicides. So I just got this picture off the internet, but it was a, uh, you know, a, a show product that you can buy to, you can use it to treat topically, or you can also use it to dip your clippers in and things and equipment that uh, you might use on one animal so you don't wanna transfer the fungus to the next. So you can spray your halters with it and, and that sort of thing, you know, if it's a show lamp. You can buy over-the-counter stuff for people. Um, so things like tenactin or Lamacil will work. Here's a fungicide that you can buy for roses. Uh, this is something that you could mix and also dip your clippers in or, uh, uh, spray equipment with. There's also some prescription products that you can get from a veterinarian. So things like Grisia fulvin could be used, or this is sodium iodide uh, that can be injected. Grisia fulvin can be bought as a powder and put in feed. And so it's really easy to feed that to show lambs, but it's not cheap. And sometimes, you know, folks aren't really willing to spend a, a lot, but uh, you know, if there's a show coming up in a month and they want to make sure that the lamb doesn't have it. So the, uh, young person can, can take it to the show, then it might be something they wanna consider. <clears throat> the last couple here, we've got copper toxicity. It certainly is a problem in sheep, right? Not normally an issue in goats, uh, but we run into this normally when we have fed the wrong mineral uh, and, and we feed cattle mineral or pig mineral or 
goat mineral to sheep <clears throat> and they get too much uh, <clears throat> uh, copper in their diet. And normally what we'll see is uh, they, they get a lot of copper in their diet and they start having hemolysis. And so this hemolysis is just the breakdown of red blood cells, which if they don't have enough red blood cells, oxygen perfusion becomes a problem, anemia becomes a problem, and then uh, their liver gets overwhelmed with trying to break down the byproducts from this uh, hemolysis that occurs. But they'll usually just get real weak and, and lay down and, and you know be down and out and, and usually end up dying. Uh, another thing that we'll see is hemoglobin in the urine. So this is kidneys here that we see. This is liver. The liver, when we'll do a postmortem exam, looks really pale, right? A, a liver should probably look more like these kidneys. Uh, it has that sort of brownish purple appearance and it, it looks kind of yellow. Uh, and, and that's not uncommon because the amount of bilirubin, which is a byproduct of uh, red blood cell breakdown, and then hemoglobin gets forced through these kidneys, and so they'll look darker than normal. And we might notice urine being darker. You know, if we do see this animal urinate, that urine will be dark, uh, which is a sign of copper toxicity, but problematic in sheep, uh, not, not so much in, in goats. Uh, another one that we see on occasion is sore mouth, and we've seen that even with some sheep that we had here in Fayetteville uh, for a judging contest at one time, but it's caused by a pox virus, and you'll see it creating lesions right here around the nostrils and around the fissures of the lip, uh, but they get these brown scabs. Uh, it's not something that's going to kill them, but, you know, as the name implies, their mouth gets sore. They don't want to eat, so they're not gaining weight, and you know, a lot of times if it's a show animal or something, that's the whole reason we're, we're trying to put weight on them so that they are going to be a certain market weight for a show or, or whatever. So, and then certainly if it's just a production flock, you don't want them not gaining uh, if you're in the business of selling uh, pounds of lamb or, or whatever. Usually they begin to appear as just a, a little red blister right there. And then that blister turns into an ulcer and then that ulcer will scab over and you get these brown scabs. And in that brown scab would be the virus. And so when they begin to shed these scabs off of their lip or nose uh, where they're at into the soil, then the virus is in that soil and it can be there for quite a long period of time and uh, lie there you know, until it can infect other uh, young animals. Here again, we're usually talking about young animals, okay? Uh, we can see it creating problems in ewes and does on their udder where these young animals are nursing. So you might see it creating uh, secondary mastitis in a ewe or certainly just a irritated udder and she might be kicking those babies off, uh, you know, that are, that are trying to nurse. Uh, so Jennifer's asking, is it is it like vesicular stomatitis in horses? It's similar. Uh, vesicular stomatitis in horses, you know, usually creates ulcers inside their mouth. And so you'll see ulcers like on their gums and, and tongue and other places. Um, and this one's usually right on the outside. You, you can see these big scabs here around the uh, nostrils and then on the fissures of the lip. But yeah, it would be similar to that. Um, one thing that we can do to help minimize the issue with this, like if it's been a problem for a given flock or on a farm, there is a vaccine that you can use. It is a live vaccine. Uh, it's a little different, okay? So it's not one you just pull up in a needle and give shots. Uh, it's one that we have to create um, a little scar. Uh, and, and so here's a, here's the example of the vaccine down at the bottom. It comes in a box comes with a bottle of solution and a bottle of powder and you mix that together and then you put drops of that on this little forked instrument okay and you, then you begin to use that to make a little uh, lesion on the inside of the animal's thigh and what we're going to do is we're just going to create a very localized infection right there and they'll get a little brown scab that forms right there uh, with this vaccine but it's going to protect them from having it on their lips and on their nose and other places um, on down the road. So, so it is a live vaccine. It, it, it's a vaccine that's much like, like I can remember my parents and grandparents having a, on the top of their arm right here, a smallpox uh, vaccine lesion. 
And that's the type of vaccine that we're talking about. This is pox, pox virus, very similar to smallpox in people. Uh, people can get this one too, uh, but it's it'll cause usually a localized lesion like we see right there. It'll just cause you know one on your hand where you got exposed. So uh, another one to be careful when you're handling these animals. All right, last two slides here are just on vaccines and what we should use uh, and consider for small ruminants. Uh, breeding animals, remember the reproductive issues I talked about. So Chlamydophila and, and uh, Campylobacter, you can buy vaccine for that. Uh, we for sure would use CD&T or something like co Covexin-8. Uh, typically, I recommend giving that, you know, to the ewes or the does before they kid or, or lamb <clears throat> uh, to get passive immunity for the first few weeks of life to the, the lambs and kids. And then uh, lepto can be a problem. That's not one I talked about, but certainly we have issues with that and a lot of species, you know, uh, throughout the state of Arkansas. And goats seem to be a, a bit more susceptible to that. And we could, we could just use cattle vaccine uh, to vaccinate goats uh, for lepto. And then the other thing we mentioned was selenium. So we can give vitamin E and selenium. And, and obviously this is not a vaccine, right? We're just supplementing because we're deficient in selenium across our state in certain places and can have problems with that. So we do that in late gestation to help uh, that uh, fetal growth. <clears throat> if we're talking lambs and kids, uh, the CD&T, and usually we, we give a, a dose of that before we wean them and then we do a follow-up dose at weaning and then we also give uh, uh, selenium to those guys other ones to think about. I mentioned there's one for foot rot. Uh, you know, that may be one that you want to consider if they've had a lot of problems with foot rot in a given flock. There were other methods of control, like we talked about, disinfectants and things, foot baths. Uh, a respiratory vaccine, uh, I mentioned that you can get one for Mannheimia and Pasteurella, which are common causes of respiratory disease, especially in young animals, so lambs and kids. And then there's one for uh, CL, so that caseous lymphadenitis. Uh, there's a, a, a vaccine, one for goats, and there's one for sheep. So we could use that and it just uses label indicates. All right, that finishes me up. Uh, I'm happy to take any questions that you may have over diseases, or even if there's diseases that you've seen that you wanted to visit about that we didn't discuss, I'll be happy to answer questions for you. Really, nobody has any questions? Geez, Dr. Powell, you're just a legit person and get everything <laughs> first go around. Sure. Well, if you do think of some, I have put my phone number here for my office phone and then uh, my email address, and I'm always happy to try and help. I was on the phone yesterday with uh, a producer from the Helena area that had had a cow die of anaplasmosis, and uh, the county agent over there called and um, he said, I'm going to give him your phone number so he can call and visit with you. But so I'm always happy to help y'all uh, if I can. Looks like there was uh, maybe one in the chat here. Um, oh, it just says good job, I think. Oh, the last one says, have you seen problems with using BOCI? Would you uh, recommend giving it to goat kids? Um, no, Cindy, I, I haven't seen issues with it. Um, you know, we generally use it in sheep uh hadn't had we don't really we haven't used it in our in our goat kids but you can see selenium issues in goats as well as sheep just seems like sheep may be more sensitive to the selenium low selenium cattle can have issues with it, uh, low selenium too so you, you could you could use it in any of those species but uh haven't run into problems with that have you sandy run into some issues with that I haven't really, but, you know, I mean, everybody says, well, just give every kid a little shot of BOCI. And, and I was wondering, I mean, is there a problem if we do that um, and we don't really need it? Because I did notice in that Clark County is in one of those light, light colored counties. So mm -hmm. um, that's why I'm wondering if I could start using that at my place on every kid and, and it be kind of a benefit to us. Yeah, I don't, I certainly don't think it would hurt to use it uh, because we're in deficient areas. Uh, I don't see it creating, you know, you can have selenium toxicity and there are places in the United States where there's so much selenium in the soil that you get selenium toxicity in animals that graze that area. But 
you know, that, that's usually up in the Dakotas and places where they have real alkalotic soils. Uh, it, it's just not a problem here. I don't see given an injection of selenium, you know, uh, potentially creating a problem unless the animal is overdosed with the, with the product. It is a prescription product. So, you know, you have to visit with the veterinarian about getting a, a, a Yeah, so I mean, you're thinking probably a half a cc, I mean, on most of those goat kids. I mean, because if it's a cc for 40 pounds, I mean, would yeah. one cc be too much since we kind of double everything for goats anyway? Yeah, I would, I would give it at, uh, like I mentioned, one cc per 40. So if they weigh 20 pounds, give a half. Uh, if you're going to give it, you know, early before they are even weaned, then you would want to give less than that. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so Jennifer's asking about Calvary 9 on sheep and yeah, that would be fine to use too. Uh, that, that's a product that um, would be an alternative to the one I mentioned, uh, Covaxinate, that also contains tetanus. So Calvary 9 would um, vaccinate against uh, both the perfringens clostridial bugs that I mentioned and also tetanus. And there aren't many, very many of the, I call them black leg vaccines, right? Because that's what cattle producers refer to uh, clostridial problems as. Um, there aren't very many of those vaccines that contain tetanus, but Calvary 9 does and Covaxin 8 does. And then, like I mentioned uh, on the slide, there are uh, the CD&T vaccines like Barvac CD&T and, and there's others that uh, you can purchase. But yeah, that, that would work fine. Uh, yeah, the next question there on the chat was uh, pregnancy toxemia. Do you continue the propylene glycol until she lambs? I would continue it uh, certainly until she's eating good again. Usually those girls are, are kind of off feed and their, their intake levels are low, but if you can get her back on track and she's eating good and be supplementing with uh, some grain, you could probably back off the propylene glycol at that point. If, if they are not back up on feed very well, then I would continue it until she lands. So on that propylene glycol, you said uh, two, uh, MLs or um, what was the dose of it? And you said, yeah, on that, it was two ounces, two wow. ounces. Mm -hmm. And is that okay? Uh, I mean, times a day. Go on goats, just like the sheep? Mm -hmm. Yes. And you can give more of that if you felt like she was an extra large female. I mean, if she was bigger than some others in, in the flock, then it's fine to give more. I mean, it's that, that one won't hurt. It, it's just an energy supplement. Yeah. Uh, so I think uh, the next question there is, can we get a copy of the vaccination schedule? I think it's this right down at the bottom of the slide that I had here, this FSA 4006. So that um, actually, Jeremy, that fact sheet is the dairy yeah. one. <laughs> we have a fact sheet for meat goats. Okay, uh, very good. We don't have one like specifically for sheep yet. But they're going to okay. be similar. Yeah, they'd be very similar to, to meat goats. Yeah. I can just take a snapshot of these slides or I can send these slides out. And that's sort of what I would recommend. And, and we can certainly try and put together a fact sheet. Uh, Chelsea and uh, Dr. Ward or, or whoever uh, that might be working on that. Yeah, we'll get that done. Okay. Well, I appreciate your attention today. Hope everybody has a good day. Thank you. I'm going to go ahead and log off if that's okay, Chelsea. Yep, absolutely. Thanks, Dr. Powell. You're, you're welcome. If everyone would do this uh, end of webinar poll before you leave, we would appreciate it. Thank you.